We are CEOs, executives, educators, and professionals from all sectors of society who support the global expansion of betterment in the world through joy and joyly. I'm your host, Cheryl Lynn, founder of the Chair of Joy Experience. Together, we have developed the World Council of Joy, and our council invites CEOs and innovators from impactful organizations to the Joyly podcast. We showcase how generous, bold, and fully engaged they are in their work and what a culture of joy is to them. Hi, good day, everyone. This is Cheryl Lynn, and I am with you again in the Joyly Studios. I could not be more excited to have secured this interview with Graciela Soto Perez, and she is in a small community in Northern California, and she's going to tell us all about that. But before we get started, I just wanted to clarify for our listeners that are tuning in for the very first time. First of all, welcome, Graciela. I apologize. I want you to say hello. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. So happy. And we're to- in Central California. Sorry, Central California, I appreciate that. And so the whole phenomena around the experiential growth uh, economy is upon us right now. And that's what Joyly and this chair of joy that's behind me is all about. We want our clients that come on board with us to really understand that um, to build an incredible culture in their communities and in their workplaces, that joy is one of the predominant uh, resources for that. And so we've got this chair. We're going to talk to Graciela about that a little bit later. But um, in, in an experience economy, when people are part of the transaction, there's increased productivity activity, employee engagement, and more profitable businesses and lots of things. So we'll get to uh, to all that later. But first of all, we're going to learn a lot about Graciela and who she is because she is a amazing leader. She's going to tell us about her mascots and all kinds of things. But before we get to that, Graciela, tell me how you got this position and why you are best qualified for it. Wow. It's been a long journey. Um, My background, I've got introduced into healthcare back in junior high. Uh, my sister, my older sister was a certified nursing assistant and she was also a candy striper, which is a volunteer program that used to exist many years ago. It doesn't exist anymore here in the Valley, uh, but at the hospital. So I did my time at Coahuila Delta Healthcare District in Visalia. And um, after that, I became a certified nursing assistant in high school. And then I decided to get my certificate in home health aid. And so I was always attracted to the healthcare component. And I also translated Spanish and English into the ER. Here in our area, there's a high volume of Spanish monolingual speakers and not as many anymore, but they're still a high as Spanish speaking. And so that's how I got introduced. Uh, I also took some business courses through the Tulare County Vocational Education Program, TICO, which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. Uh, So those kind of programs help students get involved and get exposed to health careers and also being in the hospital definitely exposes you to more than just the doctor nurse that many people, you know, kids see doctor and nurse, but there's so much out there in healthcare. It's very, uh, very diverse and the administrative portion of it. So after graduation, I went to USC, University of Southern California, Trojans, uh, fight on uh, to anybody who is a USC alumni. And so went there, got, uh, actually I thought I was gonna be a doctor. So I got accepted into the biology program, but my first year in chemistry, I changed my major. I said, you know, maybe I don't wanna do this. I like business, I like healthcare and I like the computers. Uh, And so I went to a school of business and they didn't have the program. And so I ended up in the public policy planning and development department. And I ended up majoring in that minor in healthcare administration. So then after that, I took a year off, went to Korea Delta again, but now on the business side of it, did an internship, then got my master's degree in uh, health administration and also gerontology. As a CNA in high school, we got our experience at a SNF, a skilled nursing facility. That's one thing about healthcare, we have all these acronyms. And so helping the elderly. So I was always very interested in that. Also while at USC, I did an internship in Washington DC and I worked for the Alzheimer's Association. And so we stayed in Virginia. And so also continued to get exposure to the elderly population. And so I mastered in gerontology as well. So I. But MHA, Masters in Health Administration, is the priority. So a long history of healthcare, volunteering, doing the vital signs. 
I, I feel like I'm very fortunate as administrator to have actually also cared for patients hands-on. It is very different. And um, also the population here in the Valley. Um, I'm originally from Woodlake, so it's nice to be back home. And what I mean by Central Valley, we have Sequoia National Park right here in the back of our yard. So it's really central and all of California is very long. So everybody claims to be central, but we're really central and very rural. It's very different from Northern California, Southern California or the Bay Area. It, is just geographically so different. So I feel I was best for the job because of the combination, the hands-on, the administrative experience, uh, working with the Alzheimer's Association, policy advocacy. And I always thought I wanted to be a hospital administrator. And somehow, you know, we all have our past. This position opened uh, many years ago, it's 2003. I've been here for over 17 years. And it was, it's a clinic, it's a nonprofit, it's a federally qualified health center. The mission, the vision is to treat the underserved, uninsured, it's it's perfect. So, and being also a migrant, my parents were farm workers. So I also picked in the fields with them. So it's just, it, it all around, it, I felt like it was perfect. So I had the degree, the education, and I felt like I had the experience hands-on as well. Well. Absolutely amazing that you have uh, charted a path for yourself. I'm curious. <clears throat> I heard you say quite a bit about your history and your background and your upbringing about, you know, how it is you got to be so determined and just probably a lot of the challenges that you had to experience. But what would you say was the thing that put you on the clarity of this path? Not just this path, but the clarity of this path. Do you know what I mean? Like how you didn't, people don't just get to sit where you are, you know, by happenstance. It's a lot of hard work and determination. So do definitely. you know, was there a moment when, when you said that's where I'm going? I definitely persistence also. I think it's key to success is never give up. Always be persistent. I'm sure you probably had that as well. It's like when a door closes or nobody answers the phone, you have to keep on knocking on that door. And definitely I, I, I did have, I have to experience that. Because back then, uh, this was my first position as chief executive officer back in 2003. It was fresh out of grad, uh, residency from USC. So I was young at the time. So that makes it definitely a challenge. Uh, being a woman, being a um, Hispanic, being the age, but I think for me mostly it was the age factor. So, mm -hmm. um, so I was finishing my residency. This is what I did. So USC, you have to do a, a residency for your master's program, which is great because I hear there's some schools that don't require that, but right. that's definitely a plus. And USC's motto is who you know, not what you know, but of course you got to know in order to survive, but networking, networking is huge. And so I wanted to come back home. I could have just selected an internship near USC that USC had selected with partnerships. But since I wanted to come back home, I had already done all my work at Kui and Visalia, so I wanted options. Back then, we didn't have the technology we all have today, so I opened the phone book. And also my parents, my father was, uh, kept us as women. You know, we had to stay home when we didn't get out much. So to me, it was a new world. And so I opened up the phone book and I saw, I was looking for a hospital because I wanted to be a hospital administrator. And I saw Tulare District Hospital on the phone book and I called and then the assistant answered. And I said, I'd like an appointment, uh, I'd like to complete a residency for USC. I want to see if I could mentor an internship with you all. And I got an appointment with the CEO at the time. His name was Robert Montion. And they let me in, they gave me that opportunity. And I got the, I got the interview and I did my internship there. So awesome. that was a plus because then later on through the time, this position opened at this facility, at this clinic. It was very small at the time. It was just one clinic. We now have eight clinics um, and growing. But now, so this, well, the challenge was that I applied, but I never got the call back. So I heard there was a grand opening for this facility, they had opening their women's center. So I took it upon myself to print my resume and show up in person. And I showed up in person, met with the board, the board member, eventually would be, he would become the board president. And there was a group of uh, board members there. And I don't know, they must have had maybe 10 board members at the time. So he saw my resume and the recruiter gave me a call and I did the interview and I've been here ever since. But again, it's the persistence. Yes, 
persistence. Absolutely. So congratulations on that. What I want to see if we can get to today is you said you had about 230 employees. Is that right? Correct. About 234 right now. We also contract. Otherwise, we'd have a lot more employees. Yeah. And, you know, the workers' comp way are very expensive. So the more people you have on your books, it looks a little more expensive. So we do contract janitorial, some accounting, and some IT. Otherwise, we'd have a lot more on our books. But right now, currently, it's 234 employees. So it sounds like you're probably one of the bigger employers in the area. Is that right? Actually, no, we're not. There are some other employers that are much, much larger, the hospitals. And there are other clinics like ours, FQHCs, who also have more employees. Um, but they also hired the janitorial and the and so forth. So this helps us keep our costs down. Uh, I remember when I was at USC, that's what the time they were trying to contract it at their janitorial. And it works for us. It may not work for everybody, yeah. but it, it seems to be working for us. Right. So what I want to get to is um, talking talking uh, to you as a leader in your community, you know, mid-sized organization and keeping 230 some odd employees there. So my question as a leader, as you being the leader in this community, what is your technique or or culture, if you will, um, around joy and keeping people interested and uh, showing up for work? <laughs> Just like me, I think you have to uh, actually set an example, right? You lead by example. Um, to me, I see it as a joy just coming to work. And I always, when I go out and talk to career day to talk to students, I do that. I sit on several boards, including the pre-med advisory committee here in Tulare. But I think it's very important that you enjoy your job. Uh, sometimes it's not always just about the money. When you die, you take nothing, but you know, you want to be able to enjoy your life. So I hope that everybody enjoys it. I, we are very fortunate. We have very low turnover in terms of providers and staff. So definitely that's a plus. We definitely try to take care of our employees the best way we can, including our patients. But one of the things that I think is very important is when you're doing the hiring process, which can get a little tricky, it's challenging, but they, they have the same vision, the same mission and compassion. Healthcare is unlike any other industry. It's not some, it's not where you can make mistakes and then easily repair, repair it. You're dealing with human lives. And so it's very different and definitely the compassion, the emotion, depression, and people are not feeling well. We know that. And unless you have a, a well visit, then you're well, but it's, it's got some challenges, but definitely a little bit of that. And again, the mission of the clinic aligns with the federal government under HRSA, the Borough Primary Healthcare is our governing body, although we are nonprofit. But that's to decrease the disparities of health and target the underserved and uninsured. However, we do see everybody and everyone, including private insurance. When, talk to me a little bit more about this hiring process. So when you're talking to people, not only are they getting their paycheck, right, but they're, you're also establishing a relationship and a rapport about how it is that they're going to be treated and how, they value, how they're valued in the, in the organization, what the return on their time is when it comes to patients. Um, how is how do you do all that? Is that does that show up in reviews? Does that show up in in are you doing company retreats? Like what what does that look like? So I only hire the man, senior management, and my management hires the others. However, we all share the same and some common uh, vision and so forth. And we do have strategic planning sessions every year. Uh, we do have a five-year plan. We strategize and we do the uh, do we do we do plan for it. But I think what's very important also is to have that connection. Pre-COVID times, I used to go to every single site, uh, make sure that you make you know people, you talk to them, you know them by name. It's a challenge sometimes now because I'm not in the facilities as much as I used to and. Definitely, I think that human compassion component, remaining humble and kind and always acknowledging and listening. So as for our patients, how do we do it? We also do an employee survey annually to get feedback. And so that's the best way to improve. But as for patients as well, we have the capability to text our patients. So our patients have texting capabilities so that we use the WELL program for that. Mm -hmm. and in it is a survey. And then that survey, they are they can enter the responses. Well, I read 
100% of those comments. Unfortunately, right now, because it's anonymous, I can't contact them, but however, I'm hearing and I see their trend, whatever we can address and fix, and we address it that way to try to improve. Also, the, of course, there's the Google reviews, the yellow uh, pages and so forth. So there's other formats, but the best one I think is would be the well. And I also do a survey, patient survey at the clinic. And that's how I get feedback from our patients to try and improve. Thank you. That's no small task, what you just described. That's uh, that's probably a major part of your of your work, right? Would you, would you yes, it yeah. is. Um, also the connections and the community partnerships. So also being present. I'm also on the board of the Tulare Chamber Board of Commerce here locally. So I feel like the presence here locally is very important to be embedded in the community. Have you ever dropped your phone on the floor, on your face, or in some other embarrassing place? Don't you wish there was something you could attach to your phone case that would help you hold your phone so you don't have to, or at least as much? Introducing Steady Straps, a comfortable, adjustable, strong, elastic strap with 100% Velcro brand closures that helps you hold your phone more securely without dropping it and use it easier and faster, especially one-handed. It's the only smartphone grip accessory without adhesives, and it's 100% wireless charging ready without having to remove or adjust it first. Check us out at SteadyStraps.com and order some today. That's really awesome. And how big is your senior team, the team that you have strategic meetings with? Oh, wow. For strategic planning, I actually invite my entire board. Of course, the board is responsible for the strategic plan and they approve the budget. So it's very important yeah. to incorporate our board. Couldn't happen without the support of my board. And then our senior team, which includes the chiefs and the directors. And so, uh, but on this one, I also include our supervisors. I think it's very important to get our feedback from the supervisors because they are face-to-face -face with the patients. So they may see things that we don't see. So that's definitely a plus to help for improvement. So I incorporate everybody. They, it really is helpful. I mean, it's, they could say like, even the screening process that we've been doing through the screening what, to improve that we may not see. I love that. I love that. Incorporate well, your team. I can see that you have got just a tremendous amount of passion and heart for not only your team, but you know, your entire you know community, your patients and everyone who interacts and, and sees you out in the community on a daily basis, probably pre-COVID and maybe more soon. So um, I would like to take you through just a tiny little bit of the Chair of Joy practice. This is something that teams do when they come together. And um, would you like to play with me in this process? Absolutely, I'll try. Uh, okay, so what I want you to do is just put your feet on the floor. I know it's been a busy morning already and you have a big day this afternoon. Um, if you could just relax and just get present with me for just a minute. Our, our work, by the way, is to get more teams to um, communicate and collaborate and to increase their KPIs based on fo focusing on joy. In fact, there's this book that I usually show that's way over there. But anyway, um, Joy Is was written by Dr. Paul Abel. And he is he's 74 years old and he's done a ton of research and longevity, health, wealth, abundance is all built on one thing. And that's in his all his years of teaching and healing in uh, medicine and having a clinic in Beverly Hills for 40 years is that we are um, really good, healthy people when we prioritize and focus on joy. So joy is the one thing that we all yearn for, we all look for, but yet at the same time, it's many times on the back burner and it's not something that we pay attention to because we're so busy. So here's a cool, cool fun little tool that I wanna see uh, get your reaction from. So again, take in a deep breath, just get present with me, put your shoulders down and loosen them up a little. And then one more deep breath, deep breath in for four. And I want you to tap into one really exciting, joyful moment. Where were you? Who were you with? When was it just all smooth and silky for you? And if you could describe that to me in just a couple of sentences, that'd be great. Oh, nostalgic. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's just so uh, a long time ago. Uh, my father, uh, my freshman year in college at USC. So they were allowed the parents to spend the night for orientation and my father accompanied me and stayed the night. Uh, my father was a monolingual Spanish speaker. He understood some English, but he wasn't fluent. So he did that for, for me and that was a different experience for him. So we got to stay in the dorms, but they separated the students from the parents. So that was a joyful moment for me. Beautiful. 
nothing like your parents seeing you uh, win and all their hard work pay off. So that's so sweet. All right, one more time, deep breath in. We're gonna go to one other place. Maybe you were younger, maybe it was yesterday, but something else when you were like, man, I really got this all together. This made a lot of sense to me. This feels really good. This is this is my joy. When I did my interview, actually, my interview here first, it was formerly Tulare Community Health Clinic, and then I changed the name. But I had told the board I wanted us to own our own building. Someday we were going to have our own building, and we were going to provide these great services. And now that was in 2003. Now come 2021. Now we're just waiting for the city plans. We're finally building. I bought, we purchased this property, 10 acres in 2009, and it's finally gonna, we're gonna finally start phase one. So I think that's one of the most exciting moments. Um, I'm very conservative. So I, you know, we gotta pay the bills, we gotta keep operational. So we have to be careful how we spend and when we build. And so we've been building up our PT bank all this time to be able to to do accomplish this and I got to hands out to the full team, including our providers and our team, our grant writer, we couldn't do it without everybody. Everybody had to pitch in. So I think, and I'm going to be even more excited once it starts actually happening. I start seeing it actually built, but we have, we finally put our tigers, our mascots up there and it's a future, future campus of Altura. So that's, that's the most exciting right now. Good Lord. Yeah. Congratulations. That's huge. You're going to be there for the ground breaking and all of that. Absolutely. That's beautiful. All right. So just to finish our process here, if we could think of your dad's uh, moment uh, watching you graduate and the moment where, um, you know, you realize that this dream come true, this building was going to happen. These two experiences, just kind of let them ooze through your body like this is joy for you. This is the real deal. This is why you wake up every morning. If you could give the two experiences a connecting word, one word, what would that be? Um, prosperous. Oh, lovely, lovely, lovely. Many, 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 many people don't use that. I love that. I love that coming from a CEO because prosperity is what you're doing. That's what they hire you for, right? So when would you agree then that joy is prosperous and prosperous is joy? They kind of go hand in hand. When you see this- Absolutely. The gears turning and the money landing where it's supposed to land and people going home and you know getting you know getting uh you know really living their life stream through you i mean i can't even imagine what that feels like so we're going to put this this essence if you will this uh prosperity in a container this is i'm going to i'm going to tap into your right brain now to see if you can come up with something creative what would your container look like if you were to put prosperity into a container anything that comes to mind first it doesn't matter it's not that uh I keep thinking technology. Um, I, I just keep thinking about technology because everything we do, uh, we're always trying to advance the technology. Like I mentioned about the texting, our exam beds can automatically take weight, automatically feed into computers, into our electronic medical record and, and dental record and management system. We have a, a lot of stuff that is electronic high technology. And when I think about post COVID and during COVID, how much we have advanced with technology and I, I, that goes hand in hand with prosperity. I have a daughter who has spinal bifida mm -hmm. and I hope someday she they will find something to help because she's wheelchair bound. I have three daughters and but so I think about that and care and quality uh, independence and so there's just so much going through but I definitely technology. Okay so your container would be box or, or a computer of some kind or what, what absolutely a computer a small little computer because now they're so thin and small <laughs> many years ago the doctor would go to the homes and do the care visits there i think you saw some of that now going backwards is where the patient is at home and the doctor is here we're calling we're doing video conferencing we were doing all of that as well now it's just a more matter of handling the the reimbursement of it i just hope it doesn't go away i hope we can able we gone so much. We just have to improve the quality of the images, the quality of the conversations, make it easier for everyone to be able to have those quality visits. Uh, not all visits will be uh, remotely, but some will be. Perfect. 
Perfect. All right. So I just want to finish our, our chair of joy experience here. If you could oh. take this container with you off into the uh, airplane with me and we're landing in LaGuardia Airport and there's 3000 of your CEO um, comrades around in the healthcare facility uh, industry and maybe even staff and your daughters are there. What would you say to them about um, how this joy, this prosperity uh, conversation would look like? What would you say to them? They don't get it. They don't understand that this is important. Well, just give them a few words so they can get on your train. I, I guess it's like talking to my team. It's, and as one person said, are you not retiring yet? And I say, like, like, no, no, I'm not retiring yet. But <laughs> I still have to work for many years, <laughs> but it's okay. Um, <laughs> it's what do you want to leave behind what delegate what legacy do you want to leave behind what is important what makes you happy what impact what do you want people to remember you by uh definitely the prosperity is again i mentioned the disparities of care is encompasses so many things that sometimes it's beyond the doctor to to patient visit Sometimes it might be a child continues to get sick. We have promotoras, which are promoters that are our bridge between their homes and the community and our, the clinic. This child was continued to get sick. And so we went to the home and saw that the it was during winter. Um, we don't have snow, but it still gets really cold. And the family didn't have a heater. And so that's why the child continued to get sick. And so we got a heater and that helped. It's called social determinants of health. So it's how as, as a village, a community, we can help take care of these patients, uh, the community. And so going back to getting off and being sharing that same vision and mission is it's hum humanity, human kindness and quality, what kind of life we wanna leave to our the people who will be here after us and and continue that and continue to advance and continue to improve so that everybody could live a quality of life. And that's totally the focus. And that brings me joy is being able to provide that to everyone and anyone that comes through our doors. That's our main target. Maintain your quality of life, continue to be a productive citizen of the community. If you have diabetes and you're not checking yourself, and you cut your toenail and you get can green, you're not gonna be as productive and you could fall into depression. Luckily, we have ophthalmologists here. We have doctors that can help you so to prevent that. So you can continue to be productive, have good self-esteem. When you lose your limbs, it, it impacts your life. It, really, healthcare is just a miraculous in the technology. But again, it's what you wanna leave behind. I love that. And I think I think that if people were listening, if people are listening to this, they're going to hear, you know, not only your passion, your drive, how well-spoken you are to your staff and how compassionate you are about your, your, the health of the people in your organization, and then wrap it all up into a bow. And if you were to fast forward, right. And you're now your building's built, it's 20 years later, and there's your legacy. There's the thing that you woke up for every day and your entire team. I mean, I just can't think of a better life. And so the purpose of this whole thing that we're doing is in the chair of joy is hopefully you have a chair of joy at home and you take time to remember and celebrate all the things that are going on in your life because it's huge. But really those are the important things. It's the building in the day, right? The continuous movement forward and not forgetting about what's important. So I just celebrate you um, for being who you are and for you know, being the leader that you are, I, I, I think that, you know, I think we're, we're complete here. It's just, um, if you were to give us, give me a little takeaway about your experience today, and then any last words for our CEOs and our C-level people listening, what would you say? Well, I think you hit it in the nail. I, I think life is too short. And exactly like you said, it's joy. And you really need to take time to enjoy joy, life. You know, it's, it's like, it's not all just work, but make work joyful and and they just look at the impact that will have i think it'll make you as a better person and also it will help you live a better quality life if you have joy in your life you smiling and and continue to work well, you, you've absolutely nailed the whole entire process. And I know this was kind of, um, you know, you weren't really sure who I am or what I was talking about, but 
you, I, I kind of just had a sense that you were the epitome of the conversation of joy that I want to have and that you've, you've already built a culture of joy. I mean, there's always challenges. There's always things that are going to come up, but, um, you know, maybe at some point we can talk about some ideas and conversations that we could, that we could integrate, help you integrate. But anyway, I just want to say thank you very much, uh, Graciela, for being part of our, our conversation today and helping me explore the concept of joy. Um, we believe that collaboration and um, the chair of joy are effective tools and spending time and with your experience together will help others. So thank you very much for being here. You're welcome. And thank you for inviting me. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC. To discover how you can have your own show completely done for you and turn it into a real published book and become the authority in your marketplace, go to www.marketdominationllc.com slash podcast offer.